I found this recently in amongst my stuff, and I do not know where it came from. I think I brought it over with me when I came to the Isle of Man, and before then, I'm not really sure. I thought it was one I'd bought in America, but uh, I just tried this on 110 volts. It did not light. Then I checked the rating. It said 230 volt, 50 hertz, max 3.9 watt, cost 5.2 euro patent. So it's a European light. Lampy. And it's very odd, particularly the switch at the end feels strangely spongy and odd. Let's plug it into the power meter and see what it shows. So plug it in. It lights up. Flickers, that might just be the bad connection because it's like shonky pins. The little thing at the side is just an on-off switch. It says, let's zoom down this. It says 4.3 watts. Uh, 109 milliamps, which isn't that, that bad for a 4 watt tube, uh, and 0.16 power factor, so it was roughly correct in its rating plate. Okay, I think we should explore this further. I think we should take this to bits. I'm wondering if it's using that technique that some of these use of a capacitor as a dropper, mm -hmm. uh, and then a voltage multiplier to actually make it light up and they usually just cold cathode the tube they just force it to start usually it blackens the ends quite quickly when you do that so I take it, I'm taking it apart the correct way assuming it is designed to be openable it's kind of odd the package is this going to come out? I'm just going to get all brute force now because uh, oh it's clipped back on again this is a bad start yeah, this is quite hard to get off. Maybe that's by design. Ho, ho, ho. Uh, uh, I won't give up. I shall use... There we go. So it is using a standard warm white fluorescent tube. It feels very sloppy. It does have kind of contacts here, but it's feeling very sloppy. No screws. I shall tentatively put my pliers in here, launch pliers, and just gently prise. Oop, there we go, there we go. What's going to be, what's going to be inside? The switch, I should be careful here because there's a big capacitor, I can already see that. 1.3 to 1.5 microfarad. This switch here is just pushing one of the lamp contacts backwards and forwards. That's very strange. So there's the main dropper capacitor. There's a fuse, that's nice. Couple of resistors, capacitor. Uh, there's a diode at that end. Right, tell you what, I'm going to take a little picture of this circuit board and we shall reverse engineer it. One moment, please. The reverse engineering is done and this is a very odd little circuit. It's not what I was expecting. The diode, I initially thought that would be a voltage multiplier to strike the tube to force it to light. Then I saw it was in series of quite a high value resistor and I couldn't quite work out what they were doing there. The circuit consists of a switch, a very crude switch. This red plastic pin literally clicks in and out. It clicks in two positions. One of them simply grips one of these brass strips and pulls it away or pushes it onto the lamp contact. It's very cheap and nasty, but hey, I guess it works. Components. This is the main current limiting component. Uh, it's basically a capacitive dropper for the tube. And then there are a couple of resistors here, quite high power resistors. 68 ohms to actually limit the current uh, peaks because the, the capacitor can let through quite sharp spikes and that can damage the electrodes. There's an interference suppression capacitor and a couple of discharge resistors, one tucked underneath this capacitor and one here. Uh, this one is actually for discharging that capacitor. This one is for discharging that capacitor. Uh, and that is about it. Let me bring in the schematic and show you it. The schematic. The main supply comes in here. It is, well, it's 
stated as being 230 volts AC, 50 hertz. And oddly, there's a fuse, but there's a resistor directly across those pins. But then there's a um, the interference pressure capacitor, 33 nanofarad. I'm guessing that resistor is to discharge that so you don't get a wee sting off the pins. Then current is limited to the tube via this capacitor and these two resistors once it is lit. But first you have to light it. And that's where this bit of circuitry comes in, and it's abusing the tube. With a fluorescent tube, you have a heating element at each end, a little uh, cathode heater. And it's coated with a material called a thermoemissive coating that when it's hot, it emits electrons. And the purpose of that, the hot cathode tubes, is that you turn the fluorescent tube on, it will initially heat those electrodes to heat that material, and in doing so, it lowers the voltage drop across that electrode, and it takes a lot of stress off the electrode, and it makes it easier to light the tube at much lower voltages. That's why traditional hot cathode fluorescent tubes have that thing that, you know, either there'll be a pause before the light, or they'll sometimes blink and flick before the light. What's actually happening there is the starter is bridging these two connections so that the current flows through the heating elements first and then it opens um, and that then lets the current flow through the tube if these are hot enough. What it's doing in this case is it's got this capacitor that is doing double function. It's not just limiting the current through the tube, but if the tube is not lit and the voltage across it is quite high, when this end of the circuit is negative and this end is positive, current will flow through this resistor and diode and start charging up the, the capacitor. And then when the polarity changes and this end goes positive and that's negative, it, it won't flow back, but the voltage will now be lifted up. So if effectively, it can potentially double the peak main supply uh, voltage. So in this case, it could charge up to, say, with this diode, it could charge up to 330 volts, which is the peak of the AC voltage. But then because the polarity changes, it would then be pushed up higher and that would go up to about 660 volts. And it will do that. It will just keep trying to charge that until it's high enough to actually just break over the ion, cause the gas to ionize and make it strike. And once it's done that, the voltage across the tube goes quite low. And then the current flowing through this uh, resistor becomes negligible. It's uh, the circuit then is purely through that resistor to limit the peak current through the tube and then uh, limited by this capacitor with its discharge resistor across it for safety to stop getting tingles and stuff like that possibly to modify the effect uh, of once it's it kind of struck I'm not really sure it's an odd arrangement they've optimized all these component values are fairly critical um, to that circuit operation the 60 ohm Eight, the 68 ohm resistors, quite high power, they're, they're needed because when you uh, light a fluorescent tube on each half wave, it actually goes out and then it has to re-strike. Without these resistors, the capacitor, as soon as it reached its strike voltage and then dropped down to its run voltage, the capacitor would deliver a sudden pulse of current and the electrodes would blacken all around the end very quickly. And it would basically, it does what's called sputtering. It blows the metallic coating off the electrodes and it destroys them, it damages the electrodes. So that's why they've got these resistors here. Um, other things worth mentioning. It's not a great way to light the tube. The whole point of bring it up to temperature, the ends up to temperature, it takes a lot of stress off the tube. But once they've lit it cold cathode style with brute force, as they're doing here, uh, the current flowing and the voltage drop across the electrodes will cause them to heat. And it's not ideal. It will cause slight blackening over time. But it, once it's up to heat, then they become uh, self-sustaining. The heat uh, causes them to go thermally emissive and the voltage drops. It's a very odd circuit. It's very much cost optimized with that bizarre button just pushing the contacts away as the power switch. It basically just interrupts this one. Uh, very odd, very strange. But uh, I guess that's what happens when you make lights down to a price. It was probably the cheapest, simplest way to make a little plug-in fluorescent light. And while the tube might not last as long as it would if it was being run properly, it will ultimately work. And, well... It will probably still last longer than many of the LED lamps. Well, that was a bit harsh. But there we go. Interesting stuff. And, of course, you can just change the tube in it. Interesting little light.